Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Echelon Cycling Podcast, where three cycling nerds discuss what's been happening in the week. And this week, there's been a lot of racing tour of Turkey, tour de Romandy, no Rotland Classic, unfortunately, the Welta Asturias. And as always, I'm joined by Mr. Craig himself, Ewan Wilson, also a professional cyclist journalist now, and Patrick Blake of Audi Cycling. And I mean, this week, tour de Romandy, both of you big fans. To be fair, Romandy has actually been all right, <laughs> dare I say it. A lot of people have been liking it because it doesn't include one of, well, we call them Galacticos, some people call them aliens, uh, whatever you, whatever your name is for the kind of highest caliber riders in the peloton, none of them were there. And it did lead to some different winners, and I think some people quite liked the, the refreshing nature of that. And I think I can certainly uh, appeal to that as well. I think there were some interesting winners this week, even if... They were all, well, not all of them, but some of them were a little bit unpredictable. And then, yeah, I mean, but then DSM just literally cleaned up big time in the tour of Turkey. Or what, what, I think, is, is that, that's the official whatever name for it. But I can't remember how many stages there were, but DSM took like, I don't even know, it might have been like five, six wins. They took the overall with Van der Broek, who won them out to top finish. I think Jakobsen got a win, and I think Andalusen got three or four something like that so absolutely crazy but yeah i think romandy i quite enjoyed actually yeah i mean romandy usually home of silly results we got that from the start michael zylard taking that first um prologue which no one was expecting um it's always good in this romandy opening time trial you get a win usually from someone who doesn't often take big wins so for him and Tudor that's quite a big uh, it's quite a big deal for them to sort of get off the winning ways they're going to the GDO next month and um, they they have shown this year already that they can compete at at the top level they've got some really strong riders and Zylot is another one who's um, really thrown his name out there but apart from that I mean Dorian Godon was fantastic two stage wins for him uh, along the way and Thibaut Nace won a mountain stage and Carlos Rodriguez won the overall this is Ineos's first World Tour general classification win in two years so they're back baby and they're back big time and it was ahead of Sasha Vlasov marginally and Florian Lipovic who came in third who's been a big sort of prospect for the past couple of years we've missed that sort of that big top level result from him but he delivered this week uh, with a third place here overall so yeah I mean plenty of decent racing the Tour of Turkey sorry Tour of Turkey app they officially changed their name let's clarify this they officially changed their name as a nation a couple of years back um, to the Turkish equivalent which is Turkey um, to avoid um, confusion with you know the animal and I mean, yeah, it was a lot. It was a lot of Team DSM Feminic post and Al throwing their names in, in the ring there with um, Jakobsen and um, Lund Andresen, who took three stage wins across this race. The final stage was neutralized, as was the Cy Classic in the north of England or the Midlands of England. I don't, I don't know where where, where the border is, but bad weather seemed to be a theme this week as well. Guys, you literally both said to be as long and that isn't one of three stages. So, oh yeah, well, okay. That's because it has to be repeated. Is yeah, yeah I'm fine. I'm fine. Like we could turn this into a to be as long and that isn't episode if we have to. Like I'm fine with that. One, two as well with Jakobsen. Uh, that that was quite a sponsor friendly photo uh, for them. Mm. And um, because Jakobsen least... wasn't good enough to come around him. Well, to be fair, to be fair, <laughs> on on that stage. Um, Jakobs, there, there was this weird like shimmying in the road, and Jakobsen I think had to like unclip for a bit, and he was sort of far down in in the light. He was moving up, and then had to restart his sprint. So second place in that sprint anyway is quite good. He didn't even get out the saddle in that sprint, um, so that was particularly impressive indeed. There are a number of sort of risky sprints in Tour of Tokyo this week, or sorry, the Tour of Turkey this week, where there were like, corners and obstacles in the final couple hundred meters that probably shouldn't have been there, but. As a whole, we saw some some new guys sort of rise through through the ranks. As well, Mahawi Kudus almost took the win overall. He was right up there in that mountain stage, as was Paul Double of Palti Cometa, who was saved in the 11th hour last year. He's a guy, he's like got top 10 in Tour of Slovenia for the past like two years. That put his name on the map. And then he was swept up by Human Powered Health. Their men's team folded last year and he sort of struggled to find a new team, but ended up in Palti. And he's maybe made made a strong case for himself to go to the Giro next month. We'll get onto that in a bit. I mean, in terms of the Giro, uh, is it a headache for 
the DSM to have both Tobias Lund in amazing form and then Jakobsen also in great form? Or is it just, I think Patrick said this, that it's just great for them because it, if it's a completely flat stage, Jakobsen, if it has a few bumps, then just throw uh, Tobias Lund and Dresden in the mix. Yeah. Yeah, I think he's he's definitely got a shot to sort of be be up there, particularly because Jakobsen's quite an inconsistent sprinter. Uh, he is great when he's firing, but when he's not, he's often sort of lost in, in that peloton. So seeing him on the start list with Jakobsen gives me more hope for DSM to get some some more sort of top fives at the Giro and not just to rely on Jakobsen. Because we saw it last year, Tour de France, for instance, when they relied on Jakobsen, they didn't really have anyone else for us. At the Giro, they're going to have uh, Jakobsen and Andresen to to help out. But they have to balance that as well with Roma Baldé's GC ambitions as he's going for the overall standings. It's quite an odd team because, you know, they were up like a massive lead up trend. So they're like unplaced and like, they're going to have to be quite, I think, nailed on. Like they're going to be like, this is a stage for Andresen or this is a stage for Jakobsen because I don't think they've got the manpower spare to like try and play both they've kind of got to you know utilize every man so i'm looking forward to seeing what andalasian can do i seriously think that he could be competitive in quite a few of these stages because there's quite a few which are a little bit longer where Jakobsen and i just don't expect to be that i do think that if he gets his own shot he could be certainly up there you know once you shed some of the more pure sprinters off the back like Jakobsen and Merlier, for example he's absolutely a top 10 candidate and the difference between going from top 10 to top 5 can literally just be picking the right wheel, a 50-50 decision. You know, he could really have a big breakout result in this year, I think. Super nice guy as well. Like, absolutely nice guy. I'm, yeah, we're not going to go on to be as long. We, I'm already picking him as the writer of the week, so don't even dare, Patrick. <laughs> I mean, in terms of Tor Romedy, we didn't touch on it too much, and you to big it up so much. Silly season, Romandy. Carlos Rodriguez, I mean, does this add anything to him after that fourth place last year at the Tour de France? Yes, because he's been wildly inconsistent at stage races over the past sort of two years. So I think this does um, this does add something. Even this year already, he hasn't been looking fantastic in, in stage races. So throwing his name up there as like an actual World Tour race winner is, is, is impressive. And they managed to topple UAE, who had a really strong start list here. And they absolutely steamrolled everyone in, in that time trial. So it definitely shows that there's um there's strength there. And I mean, in terms of the number one Spanish contender, him and Ayuso have been having this battle for probably since the Balter in 2022. This puts Rodriguez's name up in that list because Ayuso crumbled once again on the mountain stage of Romandy. This seems to be a, a, a new tradition that we've had following the, the exact same scenario last year. You he literally just disassembled so quickly on that climb it was it wasn't I mean apart from like yeah McNulty got the win but overall I don't think it was that great of a week for UE team Emirates considering the quality of the team they brought here it was pretty shambolic dare I say yeah like a user just capitulating and then like McNulty DNF'd I mean that's not his fault like he gets to win but that was kind of because of the changing weather conditions of the latter half of the race so him and Sheffield got good times in but then the rain came down so the latter half of the riders just stood no chance in getting anywhere close to McNulty's time uh, he, he did have a cool skin suit though Yui actually did a very good job of a national champs jersey which was surprising I couldn't quite believe my eyes when I saw something so extravagant from the Yui team member its camp but yeah I think going back to Roger Rodriguez I mean what was he second in Basque Country a little bit ago but obviously that did come with the caveat of all major GC riders were annihilated by really bad crash so obviously there's kind of like there is the caveat of that but yeah I think it is it is good he played a very consistent game I think Ineos played a very calculated game on that final climb but speaking of that climb I mean Carapaz won up there and I thought that was a really good performance but I think you know arguably Leipovitz was the big surprise on that climb because he just used Rodriguez said you're in risk for GC because if you ride you you're going to win and then he tried to jump across and to be he almost got Carapaz to be fair if he launched another 100 meters earlier it's possible he could have got him so and he is going to the Giro so Leipovitz is certainly a name I think a lot of people have recognized now in the last week so we'll wait and see what he does at the Giro hopefully this isn't just like a flash of the pan Romandy silly season style and he's just going to do nothing in the Giro uh, hopefully he gets his, his end chances because I think he could be a, a real exciting one well Rodriguez 
we know Bingo is probably not going to the Tour de France. Remco probably, well, maybe, uh, whatever. The point is, Ineos Grandiers would love to get on that podium once again at the Tour. Is Carlos Rodriguez going to do it this year, do you think? Or is it one step too far still, despite the depleted favourites list? I think it might be a step too far. I just think there are there are some really strong contenders in, in, in the Tour de France, and I just don't think Rodriguez is quite there yet to reach the podium. Even if sort of the, the list of contenders is waning, I think there are other people. But for Enos Grenadiers, he's their strongest leader. Egan Bernal's been making some really good comeback as well recently. Another top 10 here, Romadi, I believe, um, shows that he is back on onto a decent trajectory, but he's not going to be winning the Tour de France anytime soon. So I, I think a podium is just going to be too far. For Carlos Rodriguez, but I mean, stage hunting and even going in breakaways and trying to get the mountains jersey could be a really fun prospect for Rodriguez. Ineos haven't done that. You just before. degraded him to like, <laughs> like yeah. uh, Guillaume Martin or something like that. No, no, it's hard <laughs> to win in multiple it was last stages. year. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's hard to win multiple mountain stages at, 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 the, at the Tour de France nowadays. So take it as a compliment. We haven't had a, someone win a mountain stage in the Poco jersey since 2018, and I was Philip. So I want to dream big. I want to dream in a world where we see Carlos Rodriguez on the podium, but as the king of the mountains. Oh, there's no way any else to do something so entertaining. But... Oh, definitely not. <laughs> there's, there's no <laughs> way we're excited enough for that. That's far too flamboyant. But I would rather literally dig themselves into a grave to get fourth place than to do anything fun. But to be fair, when they lost Bernal at the 2020 Tour de France, they put Carabas in the breakaways to try to get polka dots. It didn't work out in the end, but they tried. And I want to see that. I want to see that energy here uh, for uh, for Carlos Rodriguez. Is he is is he is he is he going to be poggy? No. Is he going to be roll glitch? No. I don't think so. Uh, in terms of the well, we talk about these correlations all the time, like they mean something. But uh, Tour de Romandie winners to the podium of the Tour de France in recent years. Can you think of people who have finished on the podium after one? Yes. The, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Anyone yes. else last year? Chris from Bradley Wiggins. I wasn't they... thinking that far back, but sure, you oh, can have it. Oh, okay. Um, Has Carapaz won this race in the past? Uh, or am I thinking Tour de Suisse? No, I'm yeah, thinking Tour de Suisse. Garrett Thomas won it in 2021 and didn't do great in the Tour de France. Who won it in 2022? Sasha Vlasov won it. Who else is on the podium in 2022? 2022. Vingol, Pogaccia. No, 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 no. no, 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 no. Romandy, Romandy, but more important. Oh, shoot. Okay, okay. No, no. It's just just the winner. Just the winner. Just the winner. Not the podium. No, I'm regarding the podium. Right, right. I was going to say, um, I don't know. I know Caruso finished on the podium last year, but. That's an even deeper correlation, so we can go there. <laughs> Oh my god, it's a Romandy <laughs> Tour de France correlation in depth episode. Who would have guessed this? Well, I think the Pearson coefficient like, <laughs> statistics would call it would be would be weak. Yeah, it's definitely it's like a 0.2. It's, it's no I mean Fausto Mosnado was on the podium in 2021 and he's not gonna be finishing anywhere near the it was true. Hell yeah. Right. Didn't see much speed like always do well here. <laughs> yes, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Swiss Simon Spielig was unrivaled. That man was so good. Also, Ilma Zakarin won this race in 2015. Uh, there's a wonderful oh, Cycling Day channel uploaded about two years ago covering Zakarin's win at the Tour de Romandie. Wow. There'll be a link here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Here we go. <laughs> to, to be fair, go, go way back to Rodriguez for a second. I. I actually Are you saying Polka Dot Jersey? Are you saying he's the new No, no, no. I, I do of... think he could finish on the podium. I'm just providing the counter argument. <laughs> he was, so he was fifth left this year, but he was two minutes, for, two minutes, for, two minutes 20 off of the podium on like his first Tour de France. And I'm like, that's not, it's not mm. too big of a leap to think that he could do it. And in, in the Oslo, the third place. Oh, look at us, we came on the podium, but nobody really cares kind of position. Like, they will put that all into getting third place. Especially since Jonas is very much questionable about going, and even the Bulls and Roglic's like, um, preparation is definitely going to be hampered, or has been hampered. 
So it's not out of the question that Rodriguez is looking better this year. Maybe he could sneak on there. Adam Yates style. Just to sort of hug back to that performance last year, he came fifth, not fourth, fifth. Yeah. Um, yeah. With some respect on Simon Yates' name. Uh, and Peo Bilbao was only 10 <laughs> yes, seconds Simon away Yates. from overtaking him. So, oh my goodness, yes, Simon Bilbao. Yates. Yeah. yeah. Pe- Pe- Peo Bilbao, Bilbao like, we're not talking about Bilbao making the podium at the Tour de France. That is true. You make a good point. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I don't think that's quite the best place to a uh, point of comparison. I don't like also, being called out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I also think Rodriguez has given a bit of a bone on that stage to Morzine when he was sort of, yeah, uh, when he was allowed up the road when everyone else sort of played behind with the Poggy Vango side by yeah. side in the top three at that point in the race. You know, yeah. and Rodriguez benefited from that also from Jai Hindley crashing. Can I just say? Oh, yeah. Was that's that the true. stage with the motorbike as well? Yeah. Yes, yeah. it was. And then, Pog- and then Poggy got so mentally like flustered by it, he just didn't know about where the KOM point was or something like that. Oh, he was so mad. He's had, a, he's had a bad run in with motorbikes on climbs, hasn't he? Just in general. Think back, he's like, the bus. What was it, he's Catalonia earlier this year? It's too fast, that's why. He ran into one in Catalonia. Um, you know, this one in the tour, you know. We need to sort it out. Get get the motorbikes away from Poggy. But uh, anyways, we might as well talk about another race, a race that's been dominated by South Americans in recent time, and now a North American won it. Yes, Mexico is in North America. Uh, the Vuelta Asturias, uh, Isaac uh, Del Toro taking their role, and uh, I mean, I suppose you guys didn't watch it, but uh, UAE doing a solid job cleaning up completely. Well, your suspicions are true. I didn't watch it, but <laughs> from from the highlights I've seen, it was yeah, just UAE completely dominating. Isaac Del Toro, what was great, uh, won by like over a minute, so the one on one of the stages, and then Finn Fisher Black took a stage win. Which I think is funny that UAE brought like a world tour level start list to this not very world tour level event. <laughs> but like, I mean, looking at the rest of the top 10, a guy from Eric Antonio Fagundes of Burgos Beash from Uruguay finished in third place. He's not a guy who would sort of be contending for a world tour level. Oh, actually, I say that he did finish second at the Tour of Qinghai Lake. I shouldn't really poo poo that too yeah, much. Put some respect on it. <laughs> <laughs> Have you but, not heard that race? But I mean, it, it was. It, it's cool to see. He's he's like, he's like the taller, like really punch through. He is the real deal. And there've been so many youngsters who just sort of like fade into the fade into the abyss at UAE. But I think he's really pushed some boundaries this year, and he's really thrown his name out there as a as a real contender. Also, put on top of this last week in the race we didn't talk about the Giro della Romagna, he finished in sixth place there as well. So I'm really I'm really really impressed by. It by this kid and I'm expecting some big results soon. Rumor has it he might make it onto the world to this year. It's not certain, but it is potentially a possibility. Well, they'll probably do better than a user because a user apparently just capitulates seven Ks into a client. It's strange he, he he's done this a number of times now I use on these stage races, but maybe because he's like, oh, UAE, we, we have other cards to play. They have Adam Yates and yeah, Adam and, all, and all those guys, but... but all of them are still, yes, apparently. <laughs> yeah, well... Um, Rafa Meiker is there, tuning up for um, the G dot as well. He finished second second place overall. But for Isabel Toro, look at his Palmares this year. He was in Asturias, finished well in first, second, and third, and then won the overall classification. Finished sixth in Romania. Finished inside the top ten at Basque Country, top ten at Tirreno Adriatico. Sorry, top five at Tirreno. Made a really big mark at both San Remo and Strada Bianca. Was right up there in in the Tour de Nanda with a stage win. It's a like fantastic debut for a man who's only twenty years old. He is he is phenomenal. Like, was I'm it- so excited to see where Del Toro is going to go. And the news came out about a certain contract extension. He's going to yeah. be staying with the team until 2029. That's five years in the future. Isn't that mad? Yeah. I was literally just going to say that. Like, I think I was, I was just trying to remember if this was the week where the news broke that he got his contract. And yeah, it is, it's just, it is just insane how, how good he is. Like, he has made such a mark. Is this, is the Astorius race? Am I remembering this correctly? This is the one which Carapaz won before winning the Giro like years ago. I don't know why, but I just remember Carapaz doing well here. Yeah, basically. Yes. Yeah. It's the Americas. All the Americas just love this but, race. 
It's all right, so it's perfect. I'm just going to tangent perfectly into what Scott wants to say. So therefore, if Isaac Del Toro went to the Giro per se, he would go and win it. Is that is that is that, is that what we're saying? I mean, the correlation once again, th- throwing another Pearson coefficient. It's it's, yeah. it's not it's not a strong correlation. It's zero point <laughs> oh, no. zero point nine or whatever. I can't even remember from my from my stats days if that's um, if that's good or bad. But um, also on that Carapace podium, let's put some respect on the third place finisher, Gazprom's Sasha Vlasov, who would go on to a podium of Monument a year later. We're talking about Isaac Del Toro. Stop trying to hijack it for Vlasov. We know you want to get <laughs> Vlasov into every single conversation. Vlasov, Vlasov, Vlasov. Surprised you don't have a t shirt. There's no picture frame of Vlasov. That's quite disappointing. That is true. Um, maybe, I don't know. Um, once. He's not quite there. Like, what did Betiol do to get one? And not well, got, them? yeah, I got Betiol. There's there's Peter Sagan with the Pope. Don't forget that one. I've also got I've got Veliko Stoinic on my bedside table, and um, Bogatyr and Avnipola behind me. But, but no, Vlasov. Yeah, no, Vlasov. Sorry, so, sorry, Sasha, if you're watching, is yet. I, I I will sort this out. But I mean, would you not take him to the Giro? Like, could yeah. be in such great form. I would. Because, yeah. like, they, they kind of, they, they lost J-Vine, and they replaced him with like, Virgil Argan or something. Like, they've got four rulers, and I just don't think it's necessary. They've got Micah and Groshark, and there is their mountain support. Bjerg is, like, a very much utility pick. Can kind of do everything. Yeah, like, why not put Del Toro in there? They seem like they've just put in a pretty half ass team anyway. You may as well put somebody exciting, like, alongside Pogacar. No, uh, Groshan is going to be insane. Groshan is going to be so right. good at the Giro. Come back to this video in, in a couple weeks' time. <laughs> I feel like Felix Groshan, he was he was good, good in in the time trial at Romandy. I have I have complete faith that Felix Groshan is going to go going to go big. He was fantastic last year. Paris was decent on some of the mountain stages at the Tour de France. I'm all I'm all aboard the Choo Choo Felix Groshan hype train. This is the Grand Tour. He made his name. Back in 2017, when he was writing for CCC, Sprande Polkovice. I just, I feel like the way you are going to play this is that they're going to proper smash the first week and then they're just going to play it passive because they want to keep things chill for Poggy going to the tour as well. Don't want to make him too fatigued. They'll just be very reactive to stuff. So in the final two weeks or whatever, just let breakaways go all the time. Why not? As long as they're not a threat. So if that's the case... Yeah, like Groshark and Mike, you know, they're all going to be really crucial in that first week in setting Poggio, but you're going to probably have a second and third week where you're going to have ample opportunity for breakaways, and you're just going to have, like, four rulers around Poggy. Like, it would make sense, like, in an era where we seem to have increasingly young people at Grand Tours. Del Toro is clearly in good form. I would like to see him there. Obviously, I realise that as a 20-year-old, he's had quite a busy schedule so far this year, but I would like to see him here in a kind of non-realistic you know he's not fatigued perfectly prepped and state because then poggy can just sit and be like you know chilling del toro can bin like 20 minutes of the first like half of the race go a breakaway be so much fun you're what are you saying no you don't want isaac del toro Oops. I mean, selfishly, yeah, I think it'll be fun. But I think in terms of his own career, maybe do the Walter instead. Gives him some more time to sort of build up to it. He, well, maybe he almost, in the way that he surprised us, do you reckon he's maybe surprised UAE team Emirates mm-hmm. and his performances? I mean, just like, actually, you know, if we would have known that these results were coming, maybe they would have thought about sending him to the Giro, but maybe he's caught us all off guard as well as UAE team Emirates. So, yeah, maybe the, the fact that the, the Fuelt has been rumoured has been more of a recent thing based upon his results. They just might yeah. have thought he was going to do this well so so quickly. I agree. But because at the beginning of the year, after that first World Tour win down under, they were like, no, he's not going to go to a Grand Tour this year. We'll wait until next year. But now they're sort of putting the Vuelta as a potential up for the end of the year. So I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic that he will make the bottom and he will light our fires at the Balta Espana. Can he can he still go back to the Tour de la Vene? Yeah, I think he can. <laughs> he could do that. I'll be one of the biggest sandbag ever. Well, I think Tobias Boss was at the race three years in a row, so... Yeah. And uh, after winning it, though... No, no, no. Yeah, I mean, like, that's 
Torres on a world tour team has world tour victories. Yeah. For him then then to just go to like to eleven and to win it again, that would be that'd be a pretty pretty boss move. Mark Soler turned up and he was like a world tour rider at the time. Yeah, still young enough, but I mean we could go on with that. There should be a cutter with the the Tour de l'Avenir. Something like if you're on an established team, there should be no Yeah. If you're getting enough support like that, you don't really need to go to the Tour de l'Avenir. Yeah, I agree. But go back to the original Del Toro point. If you <laughs> say, say, say hypothetically, I, I'm already sort of trying to keep it on track now. Hypothetically, right? I know it's it's not going to happen because obviously I think you have released a team officially or whatever, but hypothetically, if Del Toro did come to the Giro, where do you think that he would come on GC if he was actually trying? I, I, I think because it's just such a big step so quickly. Um, but I think he'd definitely be influential. On motor stages, he'd be up there. And I think he'd try to go for a win, but I don't think he'd crack top 10. Not yet. I think he'll take some more time because he's only been ri- ri- riding at this top level for a couple of months now. The a Grand Tour is such a big sort of step in that direction. Whereas like, I also had a couple of World Tour races in his legs, had the whole year to prepare for it, then went up. Even had a half season as well before that when he was riding with UAE in smaller races. Out to Brook similarly had two years in the World Tour level, then went to the Puerto and got a top 10 at about the sim- similar age. So for me, I think he wouldn't quite have got top 10. Yeah. Do you disagree? No, I, I, I agree. I, I do agree with you. I think that it would have been quite difficult, but I don't know. I mean, we see Pelizzari, the guy who came second to him in the Tour de l'Avenir last year. He is in this year at Italia. And I guess that provides a counter argument that, but, or maybe if that's just green project Baldiani, whatever it's called now they're, they're just like well we've got this really young talent and we're going to utilize them because they don't have the the plaudits that that you have they don't have the spoils of talent to be holding him back you know Pelizzari needs to get deployed um to try and get some results for green project Baldiani. whereas del toro they can afford to uh mature in like a fine wine whiskey cheese whatever you're kind of favorite thing is that matures over time vinegar i don't know that might not be the best thing but i think that matures over time well anyway but the point the point being del toro probably wouldn't have done that great in gc anyway like he probably would have been a domestique and would have just like it would have been up to mike or grow sharkner anyway to be the kind of kingpins of keeping things together because they're reliable and they've done been there done that so del toro would like to be like first mounted domestique and we're just like shit, shit time, and just you know, for experience, anyone. Okay, honored to lead one uh, race or a yeah. big favor of the podcast. But in terms of another Belgian writer, famous YouTuber as well, incidentally, has his own channel. Remco Evenepoel is, well, one of the writers who were caught up with in that crash. And um, yeah, he's posted on Strava that on my way back with a 100 kilometer ride, and he says, soon on youtube so that'll be on his youtube channel yeah what do you think of remco yeah the rest of his year obviously broke i think it was did he only break his collarbone i think i like how you prefaced it by calling him a youtuber instead of a former world champion and world to espanol winner you know <laughs> well, the, the youtuber well. was far, far more plenty of things former footballer all that <laughs> but but youtuber that comes first yeah yeah that's um, not he's all out youtuber Mm. What I found interesting as well this week is that he's also announced, well, he's sort of hinted at the fact that he will be at the Classics next year, like San Remo and Flanders as potential objectives for 2025. Interesting to say that already in 2024, but this is nothing new for Avonapol. He often posts, well, shares his goals for the next year very early on in the season, and he's probably had a lot of time to think about things recently, um, given his injuries at the best country but maybe he will be back by the Tour de France I don't think he's quite there to be a Tour de France winner yet don't think we've seen that consistency at Grand Tour that warrants Tour de France a legend status but it's definitely pointing in the right direction for Avonapol um, we'll wait and see if Jonas Vingegaard can be in a similar trajectory soon and get back on the bike we also know Wout van Aert as well as also training once again um, so these sort of victims of, of the barbaric springtime are slowly making their way towards a potential Tour de France start that will come in Italy 
at the beginning of July. I don't know what to make of Remco going to the classic swing. I feel like it's just he's got his complete blind allegiance to Patrick Lefevre and it's like, oh no, Patrick's upset because we do bad in classics. So I'm going to go and save the day. And it's like, okay, that's all great and all. But he is literally squatting that team. In a very, I can't remember who I did this analogy. Max Van Hills, he is the Van Hills of Sudar Quickstep. That's what he is. I can't believe it. <laughs> I can't believe I just said that Aiden Nepal is the Van Hills of Samoa or somewhere else. Like Van Hills is absolute god tier mode. But uh, yeah, anyway, I don't know. Remco going to those races. I mean, it makes sense. I feel like we've all sort of thought that this is going to happen at some point anyway. Like him going to Flanders and at the end of the day, Sudar quick step out of tricks. Like they need to throw their gold on Boyer to, to see what he can do because uh, they've got nothing else to give. All their classic stars are uh, not up to the task and so therefore they've just got to try launch their last Hail Mary to see what, if that does anything. And if not, it's just going to be a big old classic style rebuild. I mean, the question was about 2024 and you both kind of sidetracked it to the 2025 classics uh but uh yeah i mean nothing about the tour of france it could be his debut tour of france is that not special we were well i was kind of cheerleading that for a long time and kind of forced you to to talk about it but it didn't happen last year even though he had the form everything and uh yeah they decided not to send the world champion to the Tour de France, but nevertheless, oh, oh. yeah, I know. I'm still bitter. I'm still sad, heartbroken. When he was world champion, and then set him to Flanders, I mean, the crowds would have gone electric. But nevertheless, back to the point. Tour de France this year is it? Is it just? I'm surprised this isn't your polka jersey stage hunter, given what he did at the World Tour last year. You and that was after he crashed, though. He was going for GC. Um, no, he, no, sorry, he didn't even crash. He just lost lots of time. Yeah, he cracked. Um, yeah, he cracked. Yeah. Sorry, I just, I just assume if, if you lose 20 minutes on a mountain stage, it's because of a crash. But no, he just didn't have it. But I just... I don't... It feels like this has been like the longest sort of... We've been waiting for this for so long. I'm like not even hyped about it anymore. Because like he's been so hyped for the past four years. It almost feels like he should have done the Tour de France already. And the fact that it's taken four years for him to get to this point, and he's 24 now. It's not quite the sort of it's not quite the shiny new thing anymore. I think I think there are other people who might be in a better place to succeed than even a board the tour. I must say, because Pogacha can't compete for the white jersey anymore. Even a has got a good shot at winning that. Yeah, he does. As long as he doesn't capitulate. Even a capitulating, is this just going to be the, the thing that happens forever? Even, even if, say, even a comes second or third in this tour, just has a pretty standard, doesn't capitulate anywhere. Just, just fair and square gets dropped by 30 seconds a minute, as anybody might do. You know, would that put your mental demons of even cracking to rest? Or would you always have this thing in the back of your mind that Abner Paul's prone to doing that? Is that just his style and what we associate with him forever now? Maybe not forever, because he's still only 24. But it's what we've seen an awful lot over the past couple of years. He definitely matured in 2022, and I think that was pointing in the right direction. But then there were some tactical mistakes in, in Pyrenees that he really shouldn't have made that led to him losing that race overall. He wasn't even strong enough to drop Matteo Jorgensen on that final stage. I just don't. I I, I don't think he's on a like a Pogacar Vingegaard level. Even well, Vingegaard might even not be on on his own level. But like, I just don't think he's quite there yet. Win a Tour de France. It might come with time, but for me at the moment, I just can't quite see it. But he has a decent show winning that final time trial in Nice. If he is in one piece by that point, um, uphill he rode it recently in Paris Nice, a similar course. I think um, he's definitely in a good position to go for the stage win there. Whilst wearing the rainbow jersey, so Scott, he will be at the Tour of France in the rainbow jersey. You could be happy, but he'll probably be wearing the white jersey by that point in the race anyway. Maybe. Or the polka dots, who knows? Or the green jersey. Unless Carlos Rodriguez slaps him. <laughs> in the green jersey classification, yes, Carlos Rodriguez <laughs> confirmed um, top tier sprinter. Did we ever get to the bottom of why he cracked so hard in the welter, other than just Peter Siri saying that he said, I'm sorry. Uh, there was no, like, wrong, like, you know, when they just bonk hard because they haven't eaten enough. The weather was fine, so it wasn't the weather. Was it just burn all his matches too soon? Maybe. He was very aggressive early on in the Volta. I think he was trying to do what he did the year before and try to just vroom vroom it from early on, and it didn't quite work. 
We can't, I think in the Tour de France, he can't quite be as aggressive from the get-go. Um, I think he has to be more pragmatic in his Grand Tour approach, um, to be honest. He was showing that at the Giro last year. He was a little bit more, more pragmatic, but then COVID ruled him out of the race, um, which is a shame. I think that Giro might have sort of put some of these doubts to bed if he was able to really compete at, at the top level throughout that Giro d'Italia. So yeah, it, it, it'll be interesting. Interesting to see where he goes at this year's Tour de France, but Sudal will need to 100% back him. We're going to see Sudal as, as, as a proper mountain team at the Tour de France, which will be a strange, a strange thing for us to watch. But um, this could be a pretty pivotal turning point in his career. The first Grand Tour has begun, the female Vuelta España, and uh, yeah, I'm surprised none of you mentioned that <laughs> already. Well, so we might as well finish with that. It was a pretty wild one, to be honest. Um, so the Bota Femenina has kicked off in Valencia over in the cardinal directions, the east of Spain. There was a team time trial on the opening stage. So you don't get many team time trials in, in women's cycling, but the Bota Femenina seems to uh, seems to bring them up. And we had a crazy one, uh, very, very close to the top of the standings. It was won by Lidl Trek. But Ellen von Dijk and Elena Backstead both crashed on the final corner. Despite that, and the team having to slow down and sort of regroup everybody in the final 300 meters or so, they still won by two one hundredths of a second ahead of... Oh, I can't remember who came second. It was Visma. So, oh, Vis- Visma Lisa Bike, who won the opening time trial uh, last year at the Vuelta. This year, there are eight stages, so the race has expanded a little bit. Uh, we have many questions to be asked of people. Demi Vollering hasn't won a race yet this year. She goes into this as a favorite. She won the Tour de France last year. But there are plenty of other big contenders here on the start list as well, um, including Elisa Longo Borghini for the Lidl Track, who is currently in the winning team uh, at the moment. She's not wearing the Lidl's jersey. That is Gaia Reallini, the young Italian who finished in third place last year, um, who also has a decent chance to make that final podium. Guy Arena really, by the way, that whole Lidl Trek team is 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 it, it's filled with like tall women. But Guy really is one meter fifty, so she's like just like she stands out in that in that squad because she's so much smaller than everybody else, which is probably great for a team time trial setup. Uh, but tomorrow we're gonna have a sprint stage. We have three mountain stages. Interestingly, one up to Hakka. You can tell I I, I wrote a pre race preview for this last week. Um, the most interesting one is a mountain top finish to Hacker, which has loads of hairpins. We were here at the Vuelta in 2012, one of my favorite ever Vuelta stages, won by Hacking Rodriguez in what was a fantastic Vuelta Espana. And the final stage will also be a mountain stage as well to Valdezqui, which is just outside of Madrid. We actually begin that stage at the Movistar factory. Well, sorry, the Telefonica HQ. Uh, Telefonica owned Movistar. So like we're starting at like their office, which seems very strange. But the Bolt has had a stage that literally started at a ham factory in the past. So this is nothing new for them to have weird industrial starts. Um, but yeah, I'm intrigued to see who you guys think is going to take the overall win. I've got a rogue winner. I Good think. Knee Fisher Black. Ooh, that is rogue. I wasn't expecting that. I just think, because what, it was earlier this year, I can't remember which race it was, but she won ahead of... of what was she? Or did Reosa win? Fisher Blackman for a second. I can't exactly remember, but I just think with I don't know, following not winning a race this year, maybe they want to have like a dual pronged approach. And all it takes is Volering to not be on a good day and Finn Fisher uh, Finn Fisher Black, me Fisher Black to be on a good day and you know, maybe that could work out that way. It's also worth noting that I think Canyon Shram have got or well, Nevia Doma reported that they've got some illness in their team. I mean, Neve Bradbury didn't even take to the start of a race today, so I don't I don't know. I'm not I'm not willing to put all my eggs into the Nevia Doma basket, however much of an audacious rider she is, very, very panache um filled rider, but yeah, I just I'm not willing to back a team which has got a little bit of illness potentially lingering about. So yeah, I don't know. I'm I, I'm kind of favourable towards Neve just because I think that I think at twenty three, I think that she's definitely in prime spot to be one of SD Wicks Pro Times next big G C leaders in the future, especially since Volering is rumored to be moving away and maybe they wanted to see what Fisher Black is made of. But more than likely it'll just be Volering. So Yeah, that's that's kinda of what I'm thinking. I have a feeling that Little Track will lead this race like Yumbo Visma at the Tour de France in twenty twenty. 
where they'll have it all the way into the final stage. <laughs> and on that mountain stage, Longer Borghini will just sort of like miss, miss the mark and then boom, Vollering is back. We've all been sort of questioning her form over the past couple of weeks. Yeah. Boom, she's back and then goes on to win the GDO. Um, in well, just before the Tour de France, then probably went to the Tour de France as well, and then we're back in, into the swing of it all before she moves to FDJ Suez next year. Marion Voss, Marion Voss. Mm. I don't care, it's not winning. I'm a huge mm. fan, so always just gonna pick her. Dipper yeah, Benton stages. She's not winning GC. She's won the Giro Donna before, so Irekhan Avramat has won <laughs> um, Tirana Dratico. No, 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 no. <laughs> that, 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 was stage, that was a stage cancelled there. <laughs> that was too easy. Uh, <laughs> you you could. <laughs> so, anyways, we might as well come to one of our favourite segments, which is World Tour rankings. Obviously, it's quite interesting. Not at the top, UAE far ahead of everyone else but in terms of movers in your screen is obviously moving a bit up after the tour of Romedy, but yeah what can we kind of draw from this well to begin with uae have doubled the amount of points uh, of second places alpes and koenig which is nice mad <laughs> that's that's like so impressive no, uh been in grand tour season yet i know i know um well uae just like he's at the Horror, which is mining World Tour points the other week. Uh, but the Cathon are in fourth place. They've had a couple World Tour wins this week. Romandy, Visma are in fifth before Grand Tour season. That's a bit worrying. Um, they have lost a lot of their big leaders so far this year due to injury. So, but I think it's just showed that Visma might actually be more beatable than we once thought. Well, other results that happened this week and how those have influenced. Because there hasn't really been that many one-day races going on. Wait, Turk, I mean, D- DSM, what, how are they doing post Turkey? Are they still, I mean, they've moved up a little bit. Mm, they're, so, yeah, they're one of they've the moved up that, one ranking from last week. Yeah. Ewan was yeah. worried about them because, well, I think both of you were worried about them with Jakobsen uh, being the only real point getter, potentially, okay, by day in there as well. I mean, yeah, it's that clump of, like, at the moment, it's like Jayco, EF, Bahrain, DSM, Intermarche, Movistar. Cofidis, like all these world title teams haven't really got going too much especially like Bobby Star, I feel like they're especially reliant upon like Enric Mass bringing in just like Grand Tour points in the tour of Welter where it's a little bit it's a little bit of a risque game to be to be dabbling in but I mean it looks like Israel Premier Tech are looking fairly safe and sound however I feel like that they're not like a big GC team in that regard so they have to get their points through stage hunting which is just quite a it's a bit of a luckier game to be playing you have to kind of definitely get the right move to win in breakaways so I definitely feel like maybe Israel might start sliding when a lot of these kind of bar rains and stuff start really just chugging away at the GC points. Yeah, I mean, they still have quite a, a lot more points than Tudor and Uno X, who are their closest threats for sort of the promotion battle for next year. I think Tudor are definitely picking up more momentum, but Israel, Premier Tag have had decent momentum so far this year. But it'd be interesting to see uh, how Israel sustain this with all the like little young kids that are rising through their ranks, how they utilize them. For the rest of the season and for next year, will they go to Grand Tours? Will they not? Um, will they sort of favor these older guys who, with the big reputations, like your full signs, like your Michael Woods? I mean, Woods did win a stage last year, the Tour de France, so let's be fair. But for for the, like, Israel, Premier Tech at the moment do look like they're in a very safe position. Astana do not. Because you've got Lusenko, DN, yeah, stage one of Roman Deep, I think they really needed some points coming in from him, and like, that's not. It's not, it's, but if they're not on solid footing. But anyways, uh, coming to our favorite part of the show, right of the week, I'm going to go first this time to Bies Lohan and Dyson. I'm picking him three stages in the tour of Turkey. And uh, yeah, I think hopefully we could get a Danish Jiru uh, Tali stage win again uh, this year. Who knows? But uh, yeah, go on. Who wants to go next? I'm going to take Florian Lipovitz for finishing Good one. in, what was it, third place? in GC in Tour of Romandy I just think it was an absolute breakout performance to be honest with you like he's gone from a name who was quite quite esoteric I'd say you had to be quite a, a nerdy cycling fan to probably have really know his Palmares but he really he kind of burst onto the scene I think yeah it'll be fourth place on that stage which Nace won and then 
second place on the Carapaz stage and a good TT in there as well. It's just a really impressive performance from somebody who's relatively unknown. Dorian Godon, two stage wins. He's 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 been good. The Catalan are going are going through a good time. Put some respect on the tall man's name. Dorian Godon, you have my heart. Well, anyways, that's basically it for this uh, episode 66. And if you haven't already, make sure to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel here as well. And check us out on, well, the Spotify version is if you want, if you want to as well. And keep up to date with every single one of us on Twitter if you want to see that and see you and making enemies apparently within our school. <laughs> I'm glad we didn't talk about that to be honest. <laughs> it's been a it's been a great week for my unbox. But anyways, with that, thank you very much for watching and look out for our special episode coming out this week as well. <laughs>